All right, can everybody hear me? This is work for the recording there. Okay, great. Well, welcome to the first lecture of CS294-158, Deep Unsupervised Learning. Um, let me start by introducing the course team. So I'm Peter Aviel. In the background, now present here, we have Peter Chen and Jonathan Ho. Um, I think you might never see them, but they'll contribute to the class from the background and help shape materials from there. Then um, Arvind Srinivas over here, uh, Alex Lee, and Wilson Yan. Um, also, last year, the problem with space in the room was resolved when we released homework one. We'll try to do the same thing again. So we promise a great homework one coming out next week that will resolve all of this. All right, communication. A couple of logistics first. Um, we have a website. It's maybe not the easiest to remember URL, but um, if you Google Berkeley Deep Unsupervised Learning, it'll probably give you the website from last year, which also links then to the one for this year. I said it might be the easiest way to find it. Um, we will communicate with you announcements through Piazza. Please sign up today for the class Piazza, and we'll link the webpage there too. Um, for questions, please also use Piazza whenever possible. Um, if for some reason that doesn't seem the right way to reach us, um, you can reach us at the staff uh, mailing list. And if that's still not the right way, you can always individually email us. But ideally, that wouldn't be necessary because um, any one of us should be able to help out. And if you email all of us at the staff list, you'll get faster and better answers. All right, office hours are all starting next week. So no office hours this week. If you have questions this week, it's uh, just today after class is the moment to catch us in person. And other questions can be done online. My office hours will be Thursdays from 5 to 6, um, next door here, uh, but starting next week, not tomorrow. Um, Alex's office hours will be Mondays and Tuesdays. Wilson's office hours will be Wednesdays and Fridays. So every day of the week, there is office hour to come and find us if you want to. Um, little tip, um, for homework, the TA office hours are going to be more informative. So if you have detailed questions about things you're coding up for homework, I highly recommend to go to Alex and Wilson's office hours. You're welcome in mine, but they're going to be able to help you better. Uh, for anything else, any of the office hours should work out fine. Any questions so far? OK. Admission to the course. So right now, about 50 of you are actually in the course, and about 50 of you are waitlisted, or maybe just here without being waitlisted. Um, if you're on the waitlist or hoping to get into the course, the course website has a link to a survey, which we'll also post on Piazza. Fill out that survey, and by the end of the weekend, you'll hear back from us. Okay? And then you'll know for next week, maybe you are not admitted into the class because we don't see the right fit. Maybe you are admitted, and maybe you're something in between. Uh, not sure that'll exist, but uh, keep track of any responses you get to that survey so you'll know next week whether you're in or not. Syllabus for the course. We have a lot to cover, because um, deep unsupervised learning is a, a pretty big field and also a, a fast-moving field. Today is just intro. So today's lecture actually will be pretty short and pretty atypical of other lectures. We'll probably go for about, I don't know, an hour, maybe a little less than an hour, to give some logistics and motivation for why this course is uh, going to be at least interesting to us, hopefully to you. Um, from then onwards, the lectures will be very different. We'll have, for example, next week, autoaggressive models. We'll go in great detail how they work, and then actually we'll release a homework on that topic uh, that will be due two weeks later, and this process will repeat. Uh, we'll look at flow models. Both of these are um, essentially ways to learn probability distributions that model data you have collected. Um, we'll look at latent variable models, another way to model probability distributions. Um, we'll look at implicit models, such as GANs. Uh, that will actually require almost two lectures. And we'll also have some time then to do final project uh, discussions. So 
we'll present some ideas maybe that you might want to think about for your final projects. You might want to throw out some ideas for feedback from the rest of the class and your ideas and so forth. Then we'll switch to self-supervised learning, um, where we don't necessarily uh, generate the data like in a probabilistic model, but there is different ways of learning representations from data that we'll see there. That'll also take um, two lectures. Then we'll actually do a bit of a recap of everything we've seen so far, because in some sense we'll have seen many, many methods that are kind of doing the same thing. Like they're learning a model of your data. Um, and what are the strengths and the weaknesses of all these methods? And how come we actually need to cover so many of them? Why isn't there just one lecture on the one that is the one you should always use? Well, it turns out that's not clear yet. Many different strengths and weaknesses, and we'll go over those. Then spring break week, so no lecture. Then semi-supervised learning and unsupervised distribution alignment. Then we'll look at compression, which is a very important application of unsupervised learning. A little bit of hints towards that today also. Then we'll look at language models. So we'll have a dedicated, a lot of the ideas we talk about will apply to language, to images, to video, to other data. But especially in language, there's been so much progress in the last year that I want to dedicate a lecture just to generative models and self-supervised learning uh, for language. Then there's a midterm. That might be a surprise if you looked at last year's website. Um, it's a new thing. Um, I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited too. <laughs> um, so here's the, well, we'll say more about the midterm later. Um, just be excited for now. Um, then we'll look at representation learning in RL, which is the last lecture. And then there is RRR week. That's, I think it's something reading, resting, and recuperation week or something. I think most people study and do projects. Um, and then final project presentations will be during finals week, just in the same slot, same room as we have lecture in. So also be Wednesday, 5 to 8 here, um, final project presentations, and final project reports will be due uh, that week too. All right, so homework. We'll have four homeworks in the class, one on autoaggressive models, one on flow models, one on latent variable models, one on implicit models slash GANs. The first one will come out next week. You'll have two weeks. At that moment, the next one will come out, and this process will repeat eight weeks in a row, at which point we'll be through all four homeworks. Homework policy. Um, you can discuss your assignments with other students. In fact, often you learn a lot by discussing them, so we encourage you to discuss. But you must code up and write up your own solutions. So everything you code up must be you coming from your head, not from just somebody else dictating it to you or looking at their code. You can discuss, but not copy anything. It needs to be your own thinking going into it. Late assignments, of course, there's always things that can come up. Um, you get a budget of a total of seven late days. You can use them any time you want, but seven total, uh, max four for any single homework. So homeworks will be due on Tuesday nights. So if somehow you run out of time, couldn't get it done, you would have worst case till Saturday night if you used full four late days on that homework to get it done. Midterm, a little more about that. That will be during lecture slot, so the time should already be uh, good for you. Topics, um, everything covered, including the lecture before. The format is a new format we uh, kind of tried out in CS287 last semester and worked pretty well there. Um, hopefully it will work well here too. The idea here is that um, as we go through many concepts, we'll make a document, probably about 20 pages, and each of those pages will have a question and answer to that question. So it might be something like derive the variational lower bound for, I mean, from VAEs, and then maybe some follow-up question, and that would be one page, and then you'd be expected to be able to derive that. And so you'll actually know the questions ahead of time, you'll know the answers ahead of time that we expect you to, to write. So it shouldn't be a stressful event. Um, but it should give the opportunity to actually study these materials. And if somebody, I don't know, you're walking to somebody at a conference and you know, they ask you, oh, any chance you can explain VAE to me? You can actually do it. You actually have remembered what it is. Um, so that's the idea here. There's going to be about 20 concepts that we think you should just know and be able to put on a whiteboard any time for anybody else and explain. And that's what we're going to put into those roughly 20 pages. 
And again, there's going to be no other questions, no surprises. You'll know exactly what's coming. Final project. Uh, scope, ideally you explore and push the boundaries in unsupervised learning. For example, um, maybe some proposal or evaluation of new algorithms, architectures, investigation of an application of unsupervised learning, maybe some benchmarking of unsupervised learning, um, some application to compression, maybe studying synergies between unsupervised learning and other types of learning and so forth. Those are just examples, not limited to those directions, but just to give you an idea. Ideally, it covers some interesting new ground. Not that by the end of the class you'd have a conference paper, but that could be the start. At least you'd have uncovered some interesting ideas where you see signs of life that maybe this could be worked into a paper in the future. If you want some ideas for topics, staff input, uh, we're very excited to um, talk with you about that. Of course, you can come up with your own ideas. We encourage at least to try to come up with your own ideas. I would say one of the most difficult things in research is coming up with your own ideas of what to work on. So you should at least try and work that muscle to learn to come up with your own ideas. But we're also very happy to brainstorm ideas together, pass out ideas that if you're not sure what to work on. One of the main reasons actually we're so excited about teaching the class is to see more work in unsupervised learning at Berkeley. For example, last year, one of my favorite projects came out of the class, became a nerves paper, and it was um, three ComBio students who essentially start working on um, representation learning for proteins, set up a benchmark for that, and became a really nice nerves paper. And this kind of got seated in the class. That's where the collaboration started. And we all work together on, I mean, the instruction team and students work together on getting that into a paper. And that's really, I think, the most fun part of the class. See what you come up with as new things, new ideas, and hopefully you see a lot of unsupervised work at Berkeley. And so when, when you are working on things, feel free to come by when, when, whenever throughout the semester at office hours or ask questions via uh, Piazza and so forth. Not sure about the next step, you say, okay, this is the next step I'm, I'm thinking I should take. It's going to be a lot of work. Do you think this is promising? Or can we brainstorm a bit about what the right next step is? Or maybe you have some results that you're not really sure what the next step should be. Just come talk to us. This is really fun for us, so don't hesitate to uh, take advantage of our time to discuss. Timeline. Um, March 2nd, your project proposals will be due. It's just a one-page description, goals for the milestone, and you'll submit it through a Google Doc. That Google Doc will allow us to give comments, and within the week after that, um, we will have given comments. We'll have together iterated on your proposal, and by the 9th, so seven days later, there should be a project proposal in that doc that we agreed upon with you, is interesting, the right scope for the class, and so forth. Then there'll be a milestone in mid-April, just three pages giving an update on progress that you've made so far. Um, and there's also an opportunity to get yet more feedback from us. So you'll, again, put this in a Google Doc, and we can just comment away at it and make suggestions, hopefully, that can help you make more progress from now onwards. And then another four weeks later, roughly, project presentations, and then reports will be due. Well, pr presentations on Wednesday, reports to you on that Friday. I uh, forgot to put it on this slide, but you can team up for projects. Um, I actually would recommend you team up. I think often more interesting ideas come from not working alone, working with somebody else. So you can have a team of two or three uh, for your final projects. Any questions so far? Great. Grading logistics, homework 60%, 15% on each homework. 10% midterm, 30% final project. Do we need to attend class? Um, well, there's no hard requirement to attend class. Um, there's nothing in the grading that says you need to attend class. Um, but uh, we would very highly recommend you attend class. Why? Um, it's a great opportunity to get to know other students at Berkeley working in deep unsupervised learning. Deep unsupervised learning is still a field that, hmm, the slide disappeared. Okay. It's still a field where there's not nearly as much work happening in the field as could be happening. And that means that you're not going to as naturally run into other people on the street that are working in deep unsupervised learning. But if you come to this class, you are going to run into people who work on deep unsupervised learning. 
And I think that's going to help you for a very long time, much possibly for many of you even more so than exactly what you learn in the class. So to also help with the community building around deep unsupervised learning, and also because the class is kind of late in the day, we'll be serving pizza every lecture, except for today because it's a shorter lecture. Every lecture, middle of lecture, we'll have pizza. We'll have a kind of 15-minute break where everybody can kind of get to know each other, chat, and that way build more community, and also make sure you're fed. Warning, um, second offering of the course. When a course is only offered for the second time, there's going to be some rough edges. Bear with us and please give us feedback. Um, especially if, let's say, you start the homework early. I hope some people here start homework early. And then something doesn't seem like, as we explained it, let us know as soon as possible. It is possible some things are not that clear. That said, in this class, we give you very low starter code. So it's less likely um, our starter code will have um, <laughs> any mistakes. <laughs> Okay, that was all for logistics. Let's pause here and see if anybody has questions about logistics before we start uh, on unsupervised learning. Yes. Is the class webcast? Yes, class is webcast and um, usually should go online the next day, I think. Um, it'll just be a private link just for the class for the time being, but everybody who's registered in the class should be able to uh, access the webcast. Other question? Good question. Yeah, it might be that in some university systems it still gives a different location, um, but actually it's going to be here all semester. Yeah. Um, is there any hard prerequisites for this class? Any hard prerequisites for the class? Um, you, you should have done some implementation in deep learning before. It doesn't have to be deep unsupervised learning, but at least deep supervised learning, which is the simplest kind of uh, deep learning problem, the first people would mostly learn about. Um, so, for example, Berkeley's 182, the materials covered in there, or um, the class Andre Karpathy originated at Stanford, that's also available online. Those kind of materials will be very helpful if you work through them. There's also um, actually Andrew Ng's Deep Learning AI, if you, if you work through all parts of that course and do, actually do the assignments and carefully think through it, you, you should be ready. If you've done none of that, then you probably want to do it soon to ramp up. Yes? When will undergrads know whether they're admitted the um, By the end of the weekend. Or at least you'll get notified whether you're admitted, not admitted, possibly or whether you're a uh, kind of borderline case that might take slightly longer. But you'll get something from, a, assuming you're on, you filled out the survey, um, you'll get a re response from us by the end of the weekend. Yes? Say it again? Absolutely, lecture's ending early today. Um, not sure how early yet, but earlier than usual. Normally it ends at eight. And so today is not gonna end at eight. It's gonna be well before eight. Actually, one other thing, logistical thing, that uh, might be relevant, especially to people who maybe are going to ramp up in the next week. Um, one new thing we're going to do this year is actually we're going to release our coded solutions to the homework. So after the four late days have expired, so nobody can submit anymore, we will release our solutions. And because we think that's a really good way to learn, you've worked on it hard, and then you can see, well, what do the instructor solutions look like and compare notes. I mean, you might have better solutions, and please let us know if you've got something better that we can use in the future. Um, but at least it gives you a reference of what it could have been, and you can compare notes. Now, we will not require you to use any particular framework. You want to use TensorFlow, PyTorch, it's all fine, but we're going to release our solutions in PyTorch. So if you want to compare your code with our code most directly, you're probably going to want to work in PyTorch also, because that will give you the most direct way to compare. Yes? Are we allowed to also, after those four days, put our solutions on to the internet and have to get them? That's a good question. Um, I don't have an immediate answer for that. Let, let, let me think about that. Um, 
In principle, I don't see any issues. The, the, the advantage of only us putting them out there is that we can take them away before we offer the class again. And it's harder to reach out to everyone when we offer the class again to take them away. But then the field changes so quickly. So maybe by next time we offer it, enough things have changed. That doesn't, I'm not so sure. You know. Maybe hold off for now. And we'll think about it some more. Any other questions? Are you able to see things from over there? OK, great. So what is deep unsupervised learning? Um, well, it's about capturing rich patterns in raw, typically sensory data with deep networks in a label-free way. Label-free is in contrast to supervised learning. In supervised learning, you go from an input, let's say, image to a label, cat or dog. In unsupervised learning, you would just be getting the image, not the cat or dog label. We're kind of split into two categories on, of unsupervised learning. Generative models are models where you are able to recreate the data distribution. You are essentially able to generate data that is like the data and often even assess the probability of a new data point. In self-supervised learning, you don't really worry about modeling a distribution or necessarily sampling the data. You are just trying to learn a representation inside your neural network that understands something about the data that might be useful for maybe some other task in the future. So often the self-supervised learning tasks are more puzzle-like things, and you'll see things like, OK, somebody feeds an image into a neural net and could have rotated 90 degrees one way, 90 degrees the other way, 180, or left it untouched, so four possible configurations. And if you feed that in, can the neural net predict which of the four things happen to the image? Sounds very simple. Turns out one of the most sophisticated um, or successful self-supervised learning techniques. So that's what it is. Why would we care about it? Um, let's look at some of the pioneers of the field, what they have to say. Jeff Hinton, um, this is from 2014, but this has not changed since. Uh, the brain is about 10 to the 14 synapses. That's 100 trillion synapses. And we only live for about 10 to the 9 seconds. So we have a lot more parameters than data that we take in in our life. So this motivates the idea that we must do a lot of unsupervised learning since the perceptual input, including proprioception, is the only place we can get 10 to the 5 dimensions of constraint per second. And the assumption here is that, I mean, it'd be crazy to have a brain that's bigger than where you can fill up throughout your lifetime. So we should be somehow using it. And so that means we need to take in this much per second uh, to make that happen. And no, none of us are getting labeled data at, at that rate. So it's got to be something else. One of the other pioneers of the field, Jan LeCun, says, need tremendous amount of information to build machines that have common sense and generalize. OK, that's reasonable. And there might be many ways to collect that information. He's just saying, he's not saying yet we need unsupervised learning. He's just saying we need a lot of information to go into those machines. But now if we think about how we're going to get that information, um, it's a famous picture um, of a cake. And this is a cake where Jan makes an analogy between the cake and the three main areas of machine learning. So Jan likes to say the pure reinforcement learning, learning is just a cherry on the cake. And what he's referring to here is that in some sense, volume or mass of what we're talking about, in this case, just a cherry, uh, refers to the amount of data you're getting, information you're getting in, in reinforcement learning. Because in reinforcement learning, it's just rewards, and they're often far apart, so it's not a very high throughput signal you're getting. Supervised learning is the icing on the cake. It's you can get a more signal, more data collected that way, often than reinforcement learning. But it's still only the icing on the cake. Unsupervised learning is where the real action is. Um, it's the whole foundation of the cake and much bigger volume, much bigger mass, because most of the data that's available out there is unsupervised data. And so if we really want to get enough information to build machines that have common sense and generalize, his conclusion is the only way to get there is to make unsupervised learning really, really good. And of course, the other pieces are necessary. You can't complete the AI puzzle without the other pieces, but the foundation is going to be lots and lots of unsupervised learning. 
And in fact, he presented this cake very publicly for the first time in the 2016 uh, NIRB's keynote he gave. Um, since then, the cake's gotten a name. It's called the Le Cake. <laughs> and here, anybody at a conference talk about Le Cake? It's this story they're talking about. Then other people uh, get excited about unsupervised learning. According to some notion, it's not an official name, but they think like, what would ideal intelligence be like? Well, they would say ideal intelligence is all about compression. It's about finding patterns in the data. And like if you have a large amount of data, compression and finding patterns is kind of the same thing. Because compression is, OK, I see this data. I can describe it in a more compact way because I understand the pattern that's underneath the data. Um, finding all the patterns is then what you're trying to do. And there is some thing called Kolmogorov complexity, which essentially says, what is the shortest piece of code that can generate your data? And if you can figure out what's the shortest piece of code that can generate your data, now you've effectively compressed your data. For example, if it was a sequence of ones, a thousand ones, if you can just write a piece of code that says for I equal, you know, through one through a thousand, uh, output a one, that's much shorter than actually writing all the ones. So that piece of code is more effective um, and hence is a better representation. Um, if it's a sequence of random bits, that might be much harder to do. And you might need a pretty long computer program, in fact, one that stores the entire bit sequence to be able to reproduce it. Solma of induction is in some ways a kind of maybe an advanced version, way to think of it, of Kolmogorov complexity, which um, looks at all hypotheses, essentially all computer programs, one way to think of it, all computer programs that could generate the data and has a prior over computer programs and the ones that are still consistent with the data allow you to have a posterior over computer programs that could have generated data and so now you have a distribution over possible explanations of your data. This tends to be not very tractable to, to compute but at a high level it makes a lot of sense and it can be the starting point for other ideas. Then there's actually extensions of this for optimal decision-making agents, so for RL, which is called AIXI. And kind of quick flavors along the lines of if you do model-based RL, in principle, your posterior over models could be achieved with Solomon of induction, and you can work from there. All right, aside from these theoretical interests, why might you care about unsupervised learning? Well, it has many powerful applications. For example, you can generate new data, and we'll see some examples. <coughs> data similar to data already existed in the world, but now it's new, never existed before. You can do conditional synthesis, where you maybe generate some new speech based on text you wrote. So not just speech, but conditional on things that you care about. You can do compression with it. We'll see that the better your unsurprised model, the better your generative model for your data, the better you can compress your data. One of the main reasons in AI people care about, or at least originally um, cared about, and still now a lot care about unsupervised learning and self-supervised learning is that if you do a lot of unsupervised learning first, the hope is that you can then later train that same neural network with a small amount of data, maybe RL, maybe supervised learning, and from a small number of labeled examples do well on a supervised task. Whereas if you only had to rely on supervised data, you might need a very large uh, set of annotated data. So this is effectively transfer learning, but it's transfer where initially you do unsupervised learning and then later you do supervised learning. It can also be intertwined at times. Um, so it's actually some of these things that have already had production level impact. For example, this Google's uh, Bird uh, is a very recent paper so about like a little less than two years old, and it's already uh, now underneath the Google search engine, and it's probably the, the biggest improvement to the Google search engine in a very long time by just better understanding documents, what, what essentially is the content of a document, because that's what you search for rather than a specific string. Also, unsupervised learning, as we go through, you'll see provides many flexible building blocks that you might reuse in other efforts. So it's not just what we cover is relevant for unsupervised learning. A lot of what you do in neural nets is thinking about architectures, and architecture ideas that play a role in unsupervised learning might also start playing a role in other uh, domains like supervised learning or reinforcement learning. So let's look at some examples, some pretty early examples. This is from 2006. These are class conditional um, images generated here, MNIST images, 
with something called deep belief nets. Deep belief nets have gone a little bit out of fashion. Um, not a lot of people work on them these days, but they were the first model people got to work um, to get these kinds of results. Um, then more recently, variational autoencoder uh, can do unconditional digit generation. They're not perfect, but this is also 2013. You'll see things are going to improve as we step through these slides. Um, then 2014 um, was when generative adversarial networks were invented by Ian Goodfellow and collaborators. And it was, I would say, the first time most people working in the field would say, hold on for a moment. All these previous images, it was even just digits, but it still didn't feel that realistic. And here, all of a sudden, there were faces that really had a sign of realism. Maybe the image on the right, a little less, but it was this notion that this might actually allow us to generate realistic images if we can somehow find a way to improve upon this. Then people started improving upon this, and very quickly. Um, this was just a year later. This is now all uh, bedrooms, so images of bedrooms generated by the neural network. These are not training images. These are automatically generated images by the neural network. Then um, here are faces generated. Again, this is 2015, just one year before GAN was invented. One year later, um, this is the quality we're getting. Then 2017, we see um, how similar ideas can be used to do super resolution. So turn a low resolution image shown, um, where is the, well, the low res is not, not shown here, but in goes a low resolution image. Then you have traditional interpolation schemes, and then you have the GAN, second from the right, and all the way on the right, the high resolution you're hoping that you would end up with, or something close to that. You can generate images that do effectively image translation, where here horse is translated into zebra, done by Alyosha Efros group here at Berkeley. And then I'd say one of the, the big coming of age things for GANs, or kind of really, truly coming of age, was this 2018 result um, a little over a year ago. Oh, why did I not play? So these are all automatically generated images by the neural network, high resolution. And the reason sequential images coming one after the other are pretty similar is because there's a latent code going into the network, which gets turned into an image. And the latent code is slowly varying. As the latent code slowly varies, we see that the image also slowly varies. And every step along the way, almost every step along the way, shows something quite realistic as the output of the neural network. There's even music here. Well, you see here, what makes the recent sequence of images so interesting is that effectively it discovered the notion of changing the viewpoint on objects all unsupervised. Because you could see it was getting different viewpoints on the same object by changing the latent code. Let me mute this up. Here, though, it's learning interpolation between those two uh, like separate images. It's not like it's learning the concept of what like, a car or a watch may be. It might be like training something. But... So, are these just interpolations in this video? Do you remember? You want to grab the mic for a moment? If you want to switch it on. Yeah. So the video uh, you feed in the class, and then you feed you feed in a latent variable z, some 128 dimensional vector, uh, and the different latent variable you change, you get different images, right? So that's how a gentle model works, and the deep neural net is transforming that latent code into the actual image. And like Peter said, uh, it was never fed in information to condition on the pose or like the actual texture. If you, if you just feed in, say, a dog or a car, it's not given any information about what specific car it is or what specific breed of dog it is or something. Uh, 
but it's still able to uh, understand like different texture patterns, different geometric aspects like poses, and um, you know, if it's generating humans, it can generate uh, different uh, aspects of the hair or other parts of the face and so on. So it is understanding concepts that are not present in the classes because it's seeing a lot of data. And from there, people went on to just another year later, or also 2018, generate extremely realistic faces. So these are faces that are not of people in the real world, but they look like they could be faces of people in the real world. Um, which of course, uh, for some of these people, can still figure it out at times, but it's becoming harder and harder, and you could imagine that for sure, 10 years from now, and probably much, much sooner, it's going to be impossible to distinguish a automatically generated face from a picture of a real person in the world. Then audio has um, seen a similar revolution. So if you look at audio generation here, it's going to be going from text, turn that in, so a sequence of characters or words, turn that automatically after a bunch of training, into speech. And so traditionally this is done parametrically. You would essentially look at words or parts of words and you'd have essentially, for every word, you might essentially look at the dictionary and it tells you the pronunciation of that word and you just use that and sequence that together, maybe with some smoothing between the words. Um, and so you might get some. Let me see if I can get that to go through the speaker. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So, again? The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So it's a very kind of monotonic way of saying what was being said here. Compare that with WaveNet. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. And so Waveness was kind of the first big breakthrough where listening to sound, it actually sounded very realistic. It was hard to distinguish. If a human had read that, I mean, of course, if it was your friend, you know, my, maybe not their voice, but human voice versus computer-generated voice became very hard to distinguish. So uh, one thing I just want to add to the WaveNet point is that uh, uh, these systems have to work when you're using your Google Maps or something, right? Like when it's dictating your directions. Or so, like, so the, uh, the the generations you saw, like maybe you didn't see too much difference, but uh, those minute differences make a huge impact when you're in noisy s surroundings or something. So that's why it's so important to get the natural speech uh, generation working. Then here's another example. This is from just a few months ago, um, showing it's now possible to generate pretty realistic looking videos. So not just single images anymore, but videos that are a couple seconds long um, that look like real videos. Obviously they're, they're on loop here, but um, they're a couple seconds long and they look like reasonable video segments. Hi, so uh, just like how we saw image generation and audio generation work really well, uh, one of the probably even bigger success in generative models has been on language. Uh, so this was uh, the famous Char RNN uh, by Andre Karpati back in 2015, um, which was just an LSTM. Um, and you could see that it's generating uh, some kind of uh, coherent sentences um, like like yeah uh, it's it's getting the notion of language the grammar some meaning and like what words go in together and so forth uh, and it, the nice thing is since you earlier people used to work 
with bigram models and ngram models where n is some reasonable value that you can deal with as far as your building frequency tables goes. But the nice thing about uh, char or nan is that uh, the neural net doesn't care about what data you feed it in as long as it's some discrete sequence. So it doesn't just have to be uh, uh, English where uh, you s clearly understand what tricks you need to do to make statistical n-gram models work. It can also work on uh, a bunch of LaTeX. Uh, 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 if you throw in a LaTeX document and just uh, learn a char and then over it, it's actually beginning to generate uh, some mostly syntactically correct uh, LaTeX code that you can actually render and see. For instance, Andre tried it on algebraic proofs uh, by creating a data set himself of like some archive papers or something. Uh, so, it, so a caveat is that it wasn't able to compile. Uh, I think they did do some final uh, changes to co make it compile, but it was more or less uh, compilable. So that's already amazing because um, this was back in 2015 and it was able to understand uh, anything, English, uh, Shakespeare novels, uh, LaTeX documents. I think Andre also tried it on Unix code and it was gener generating syntactically correct code. Uh, it was so exciting that even uh, uh, Linus Torvalds actually uh, wrote, some, wrote some Google Plus post about it. So uh, that was, that was uh, pretty, uh, pretty big at the time, char RNN. Um, but Obviously, nobody uses LSTMs to train language models anymore. And there is a new powerful architecture called a transformer. And OpenAI basically took it to a whole new level with their GPT-2. Uh, so for instance, this is a human prompted. Uh, by prompt, it's just the initial sequence of uh, tokens or words that the model takes in. And it's asked to complete the rest. So in here, it's like a train carriage containing control nuclear materials was stolen in Cincinnati today, its whereabouts are known. And now the GPT-2 is going to complete it because of using its trained language model. So here's one completion. The incident occurred on the downtown train lane, which runs from Covington and Ash Ashland stations. In an email to Ohio News outlets, the US Department of Energy said it's working with the Federal Railroad Administration to find the thief. So you, you, you can actually see it's understanding that Steel is associated with a thief, and like, uh, and nuclear is associated with energy, and uh, Cincinnati is associated with Ohio, and, and also that so the federal administration has to come in because it's important, and you know, and, and and because it's stolen, it understands that you need to find someone who's stolen it. So it's understanding so many fundamental things. So the question is, uh, how much cherry picking goes into uh, showing these examples? That's a really good question. Uh, it, like the, I can't quantify exactly how much it was for this example, but I think OpenAI, when they did the release, uh, they tried around 25 to 100 different completions and picked the most interesting ones. But they were also somewhat honest about it, where you can see various different completions too. And in general, there are websites like we've shown now where you can actually see different completions yourself by running it multiple times. But that's a great question. It's not like humans where, it's not like you, you, when you go talk to someone and you have to wait for 100 times uh, to see what, what responses they will give and then pick whatever you want to hear, right? <laughs> so uh, the language model is obviously not at human level yet. But it's, all, it's amazing that at least one of the responses is so coherent, understands fundamental aspects of the real world, like uh, energy and uh, stealing and you know federal departments and so forth. And here's another completion. Oh, it's a continuation. Okay, uh, the theft of this nuclear material will have a significant negative consequence on public and environmental health, our workforce, and the economy of our nation," said Tom Hicks, the U.S. Energy Secretary, in a statement. Our top priority is to secure the theft and ensure it doesn't happen again. So it clearly understands that. Nuclear is like something really uh, important, like it has significant consequences, right? And the stolen material was taken from University of Cincinnati's Research Triangle Park nuclear research site, according to a news release from department officials. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission did not immediately release any information. 
According to the release, the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Materials Safety and Security is leading the team's investigation. So it also knows how to complete it with a story, right? Like it's, it's coming up with an entire story, basically. And that's what mostly, it had a big controversial release at that time because uh, OpenAI felt that people could use this kind of a model. Uh, you can even call it a technology because uh, news, news writers don't need to understand what a transformer or what an autoregressive model is, right? For them, as long as they have a website and they just feed in some prompt and it's completing it, it becomes a software actually then. And then they can actually write fake news saying they can give some fake prompt and then write up a coherent story. Uh, there, there was the, the other side of the argument is that humans can also write fake news pretty well. Uh, like that's really the biggest problem in the internet now. So, so, but, but the point is you, need, you do need to take significant amount of effort into generating a convincing fake story, right? And, 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 and it's possible that neural nets can do that uh, way better because they've just seen a lot more data and they, they don't have to understand about like how to fool people and so forth. So, uh, so th this, this is really the state of language models now. It's, it's probably even better because it's very likely the models are scaled even further now. But this was very, this is, you can see the significant uh, difference from char and n to this, right? From a few sentence, from one sentence or a couple of sentences to an actual news story. And finally, yes, so again, it's stressing on how safety is so important as far as nuclear goes and environment. So here is another thing which I really like. This is also pretty interesting to see because the model doesn't actually need to be grounded in what reality is. Uh, it can actually figure out a story even if you ask, give it a prompt as if there's this alternate reality, right? So, so recycling is good for the world. Uh, and then you say, no, you could not be more wrong. So now you want the model to actually argue for recycling being bad for the world. And it's actually able to do it pretty well. Uh, it's bad for the environment. It's bad for our health, economy. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. It's, it's, it's not good. It's destructive. It's a major contributor to global warming and contributes to obesity and diseases like cancer and increases the cost of a product and in turn the price of everything that's made of the product. And it's not good for the nation. Pay a tremendous price for the privilege of having the world's most advanced and efficient recycling system and it's a colossal waste of time, energy, money, and resources. And of course, there is no information gain in any of these arguments, but it's still able to put in a coercive paragraph that might appeal to the layman, right? And that was open as point. It was more like, hey, uh, this is already crazy. And then, so, so, so here's a website, uh, Talk to Transformer, uh, that we can actually go check out. Uh, maybe Yeah, do you guys have any suggestions for some prompts? Taylor Swift is the best singer in the world. <laughs> Sorry, what? Taylor Swift is the best singer in okay, the world. Okay, let's try. <laughs> this place, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we should try the other one. <laughs> okay, so it's not that good. We probably need to try again. <laughs> Okay, so this got the sense, like the sentiment, I guess. The respect for Swift is greatly exaggerated. She does want to be, she does want to be what I think she is. It's a very cool feel. <laughs> anyway, so let's try again. So he thinks it's happening this year. Keeps saying that all actually. 
So we were, <laughs> we're now a little over a month away. <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually see it's also getting things like wired, IEEE, Spectrum, robots, you know, it's like a huge dictionary lookup, which is sort of ma mind massive patterns, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the question is what text data it was trained on, because it's clearly really good. It's trained on, so what OpenAI did is they scraped a lot of Reddit links, and anything that had a karma of over three or something like that, they just took it. And if, if it had a link to some web page, they also took the content of the web page, and then they created this massive data text called web text, which some people have tried to recreate it open source, and it's actually available. So, uh, so that, that's what they trained on. But I think that was still order of 40 gigabytes, which is not much. Uh, in the internet is actually, you can, you can say it's roughly terabytes of text, right? So it's not much. Yeah, anyway. What do you? No, last question. Okay. This one? Okay. Okay, that's enough fun with language models. Uh, so let's look at um, compression which Peter talked about. Uh, obviously, we're not gonna get into the details of uh, how these models work, that's the next lecture. But uh, compression basically means you're trying to, uh, it, you're trying to compress data in a lossless way such that you store away less information, right? And then the decoder side recreates that information. So uh, generative models, especially autoregressive density models, can actually learn probabilistic models of your raw data uh, very, very high dimensional data. And you can report log likelihood scores. And the lower the log likelihood score, the better a model is at compressing the patterns present in the raw data. And there's a CIFR 10 data set, which is a, which is a 50,000 images, 32 by 32 images data set, which was created by Alex Krusevsky long back. And people usually benchmark on that. And on that particular benchmark, you can see that the bits per dimension, which is, so there are like 32 times 32 times three, uh, as far as the data dimension goes. And each of these numbers is an eight bit number, right? So, uh, because a pixel is zero to 255, so you need eight bits to store. If you had no information about the data at all, if you had no understanding of the patterns in the data at all, you would allocate eight bits for every pixel. And so you would store uh, eight bits per dimension where there are like 32 times 32 times three dimensions. But if you had, if you did some more work and actually looked at all the images and saw that there's a lot of common patterns across pixels at every spatial location and across images, then you don't need to allocate eight bits. You, need, you, you can allocate way lower. And that's what compression gets you and that's what unsupervised learning gets you. And if you look at the state of the art models, uh, it all started with pixel CNN, which reduced it to three bits per dimension from all the way from eight bits. And now you can see that the models are gone way better. It's like 2.8 bits per dimension. So even these, like, like you, it may seem like, oh, what is this? It's just 0.2 and like, oh, a lot of effort. But, but, but it's actually really hard because the, you only have 50,000 images to train on and the test set is different from what you trained on. So CIFAR is like really, really hard. So you're trying to create models that are really generalizable. And NVK8 is similar, similar to CIFAR, it's a small language uh, compression benchmark. And uh, you can similarly see that self-attention and transformers have had a huge impact there and uh, getting bits per dimension of 0.99. Uh, ImageNet 64 by 64 is a, a downsample version of the original ImageNet data set. Uh, so you can argue that if, if it works for CIFAR, it should also work on a lot more images because there's a lot more patterns to mine from. And that turned out, turns out to be true. And similarly, right, right how Pixel CNN started off with 3.57, uh, now it's all the way down to 3.44. So that's the uh, compression story as far as autoregressive density modeling goes. And we learn a lot about how these models work, what are the details needed to make it work. And uh, Wilson and Alex have prepared an excellent homework for the Pixel CNN. Uh, story. So you, you learn a lot about how actually the models can, how you need to implement them, what are the details you need to take care of, and so forth. 
And one, one, one point again, which I wanted to make is the same models, the same class of techniques, the code will be more or less the same except for the data loader and the output loss, uh, output distribution. The same thing works on audio, on images, on text, different image data sets. So that's amazing because uh, if you were to compare it to uh, compression, uh, which is not distribution aware, like JPEG, it, it, the set of hacks needed to get whatever, four bits per dimension in JPEG, uh, it, there's a lot of image specific hacks. There's a lot of video specific hacks. Like for instance, JPEG works by converting images into a bunch of contiguous blocks and then taking the Fourier transforms, uh, the discrete cosine transforms and so forth. Uh, and for videos, it takes the motion vector on videos. But these methods, the generative model approach, it does not take into account all this inductive biases at all. And that means that in future, if you were to ever think of compressing more complicated data sets like point clouds or, uh, or, or data sets relevant for augmented reality or virtual reality, then it, it may be easier to just take the, the best deep learning pipeline rather than creating a new hacky JPEG of sorts for that particular modality, right? So that's why progress and compression is really, really important. And that said, uh, we don't want to make you think that generative models are uh, compression technologies. Like if you want to actually care about real world impact, uh, image compression or video compression, it's better to focus on the lossy version rather than the lossless version. Peter will cover all, like, or in future we'll cover all these what is the difference between lossless and lossy? How is it lossy, lossless, and so forth? But uh, imagine lossless being uh, not losing anything about the data that you stream, whereas lossy is like you're losing some information, like high frequency aspects. And these techniques work on really large resolution images like JPEG, uh, like, J like JPEG, JPEG 2000, and, uh, and all that. But even in that space, deep neural nets are having a huge impact. There is a startup called Wave One, which is applying learned compression techniques for lossy compression pipelines, both in high resolution images as well as videos. And they're using a lot of ideas like taking the most learning some op learned optical flows and all that. Uh, and and, and you, you should check it out if you're interested in compression as, a, uh, as far as technology goes. And, uh, but, but it's not, it's not far, uh, un unimaginable that maybe we'll have a great generative model that works even in the lossy scenario uh, and, and we'll have to adapt the current pipelines for that. So that's also an interesting direction for future work. And so there was the other aspect that Peter stressed on the initial motivations for the class, which is downstream tasks. And so far you've seen uh, lang uh, language modeling that, that kind of work, uh, like could generate a lot of text. But what if you wanted to take that language model you trained and apply it for something else? And OpenAI, before the GPT, they used to train uh, language models with byte RNNs or byte LSTMs, which is a separate kind of LSTMs. And uh, one of the hidden dimension in the LSTM was actually able to discover sentiment, the aspect of sentiment, without actually having any label data for text to corresponding sentiment. So if you look at it, green is more positive and red is more negative. And, it's, and this was just like the neural net is running through this text and it, just tracking this one hidden dimension that's responsible for the sentiment. And you can see how it's correctly able to capture that, um, the, like you know, the aspects like uh, beautifully developed and all that is like really positive, whereas uh, movies is dreadful, it's like really negative. So that, that's another aspect that you, yeah. So the question is, how, do, how does it understand this? The, they do not, the, 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 the nice aspect is they do not use any kind of signal. They just train the language model. And that language model would have captured some features in its LSTM hidden states. Now you throw new data at it and you just track the hidden state. It's actually uncovered the sentiment uh, feature. Because for it, that means that to generate long-term cohesive language, it's important for you to understand sentiment. And therefore, it captured it. And now you can use it for a downstream task. Yeah. So you're saying that like one specific feature of their hidden layer corresponded directly to sentiment? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why they call it the sentiment neuron. Uh, so.
So I think Shar Arnan from Karpati also had similar kind of visualizations. So the more, like apart from sentiment, sentiment analysis is probably really like not the most hard, uh, hard NLP task. There are a lot harder tasks like lang uh, benchmarking language understanding, like given a sentence and another sentence, you're trying to predict if one entails the other or they contradict each other or they are neutral with respect to each other, or, or just given a sentence, you're trying to predict if it makes sense or not. And, and so there are a lot of these benchmarks created by language, uh, language folks, and uh, none of the top 10 has anything other than a transformer apart from the human baselines. And if you look at the human baseline, the average glue score is 87.1, and massive transformers, either BERT or BERT kind of models, they're all all the way up till 90. This doesn't mean that, oh, that's it, like we, we saw languages, we're already better than humans. Uh, that's not the case. The benchmarks were created for, when they were created, the current best models that were using LSTMs and attention, uh, they, they were not as good as the human baselines. Like the human baselines, 87, those LSTM baselines were like very low, like 60 or something, like even lower than that. Now with all the pre-training, unsupervised pre-training and Transformers, it's gotten all the way above the human level. Uh, but that, so they are constantly going to create new benchmarks, like they created super glue, and like they keep creating more benchmarks, and in uh, that way we also work on research that progresses more on language understanding. But the story is um, pre-training, which is BERT, we'll talk about it later, but the way it works is it just takes in a text, it hides some portions of it, looks at what's remaining and tries to predict the hidden portions. And it trains like this on like map, all of Wikipedia, a lot of internet data, and then it's learning a great feature space. And then you take, it, take, the, take that particular transformer and you fine tune it on any of these downstream tasks and it's able to beat all the uh, existing baselines. Now what is the case in computer vision? Uh, so, before that, I want to mention that there was a particular bet made by, uh, between Jitendra and Alyosha at Berkeley here. Uh, obviously, it's not relevant because Jitendra's timeline for that is uh, September 2015. So it's like we're already like way past the date. But uh, the bet was that there is this model called RCNN, which is an, uh, a pipeline for object detection in computer vision. And there is a benchmark called Pascal, where the amount of label data available is very little. So the only way in which you can get object detection to work there is to use a supervised uh, pre-trained checkpoint for the ResNet backbone that you use. And Jitendra set to, uh, made a bet with Alyosha that, that you cannot have any backbone without supervised learning that works as well as supervised learning. And for a long time, this bet was true. Like even last year when we thought the class, it was true but it's, not, it's no longer true. Uh, like the best supervised learning performance, if you use even a really, really deep model like a ResNet 152, you can get this metric called mean average precision up to 74.7 .7 on the Pascal benchmark. But now all the models uh, that, that were trained with self-supervision were, were never getting all the way up to 74.7. .7. They were all stuck with uh, like even if they tried training all possible self-supervision objectives in one model, it, it was only able to get up to 70.5. That was a significant gap. And the latest methods like momentum contrast or MOCO from Facebook and CPC, which is from DeepMind, uh, both these methods are able to beat the supervised baseline of 74.7, .7, MOCO gets 74.9, slightly more and CPC v2 gets 76.6, .6. though MoCo is using a 50 layer backbone, so obviously it'll get better with the deeper backbone. And this was like, this also means now that self-supervised pre-training can not just help in language, but also in vision. And by help, I don't, I, I, I don't mean that it'll just make your model slightly better, it can make significant improvements, especially when you don't have a lot of label data, as in Pascal. So, just like how BERT changed language, I think CPC or contrastive pre-training, it's, it's, it's on the path to changing like vision benchmarks as well. And just like how people made strides in harder language benchmarks like, uh, like, like uh, squad, which is question answering, 
and glue, which is language understanding. In vision, I think it's possible that in instant segmentation, detection, post estimation, and so forth, uh, backbones from self-supervised learning would most likely be better than supervised learning. And that's, that's already going to have a huge impact. So uh, as a summary, as a conclusion, the gelato bed is, 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 is like if you ignore the timeline, it's, it's been solved very recently. So uh, yeah. So in summary, uh, unsupervised learning, it's a rapidly advancing field uh, thanks to compute thanks to very, very good deep learning engineering. I, I can't stress that even further. It's like one of the most important aspect in all these successes is a lot of, lot of focus on low level details. And, and in the class, we hope that you take that back with you because that's the most important aspect in any of this research, like BERT or CPC or generative modeling. A lot of the work goes into how you write the architecture, how you write the data loaders, what kind of augmentations you use, what, what is the learning rate schedules, like everything. So uh, we, we want you to understand those details by working on the homeworks and try to understand like how even small changes can make huge differences. And there are also a lot of people working on it now. It's no longer a niche field. Uh, and there's a lot of good available data sets like ImageNet, Wikipedia, and, so, and all that for different modalities. And it's not just an academic topic anymore. It used to be very academic when Hinton was working on deep belief nets, but, or, or even when sentiment neuron was done, like not a lot of people were working on unsupervised learning. But now it's already like a production level impact, like it's, it's already in all of the uh, technologies we're using in every day, and vision will also have a huge impact, uh, like how it had in language, and uh, so it's the right time to sort of focus on how these models, the various class of models work. So, this most important thing is what is true now may not be true even a year from now. So when we, like when we taught the class last year, self-supervised learning was really bad for vision. Like it's like uh, the linear classification scores or the downstream performance, they were not as good as supervised. And the, most people were like, oh no, it's, it's never going to beat supervised. And, but now it's actually beating supervised, not just in the low data regime, but also in the high data regime. And that means that even if you argue that you, if you have a startup and you just want to uh, hire people to annotate more data for you, it's possible that the f final peak performance you get will be from pre-training and then doing supervised learning rather than just doing supervised learning. And all these are really working very well. And the best, it's, all, it's the best time to learn these various class of models like language modeling, image generation, pre-training uh, for different modalities. It's, it's the best time to learn like these models really well, and you can make impactful contributions in like various ways. Like you can try to improve these models, which is really hard because these models are already working so well. But you, you could, but, 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 but you could also think of taking what what the aspects, the key aspects that make these models work, and put it in some other domain where they haven't seen the successes. For example, you could you could try to make a huge impact in RL, where, where pre-training doesn't work yet, or you could have a, uh, you know, like Peter pointed out, one of the best projects of last class, was, uh, last, last offering was using it for protein folding benchmarks or, or, or general benchmarks about protein understanding. And like these are domains where even deep learning is still new. And so you can, instead of directly going for the supervised learning solution, you could think of just going for the unsupervised learning because it's likely to work better in the long run. Um, and finally, I think fund fundamentally autoregressive density modeling, flows, VAEs, are, are applying all kinds of unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning for RL. That's a huge room for improvement. Like, uh, like for instance, the same kind of statements uh, we were able to make about language modeling or pre language and vision pre-training, we cannot make for our, our, these, these topics because th there is no huge uh, paper that just says, oh, this is done, it's over, or, or like something like that. So that means that there's way more scope for research to be done there. And, you, and, and there's way, 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 like this class can be useful for you to do that. So we hope that you, you can take what you want to take from this. Uh, if you're interested in your own applications, you can uh, study the general class of techniques and then figure out how to apply them. Or if you're just interested in making progress on the general techniques, you could uh, try to like pick one of them and try to make improvements on that. And the projects are like a great, great, great place to do that in the, in the class. And um, hopefully the homeworks also teach you how to do that very well.
Thank you. If you have any more questions for us in person, come find us in the next few minutes up front here, and otherwise see you next week.